well as the exhibition that Raphael and Crystal Fowler. So both of them will have an exhibition from 4 to 6 tonight. Come by. And a little bit about Lois. Lois Piazza is a queer series-based artist working in photography, audio, video, and performance. Her photo series, New Domesticity, is currently on display in the National Gallery. And her exhibition was curated on the occasion of the Laramie Project, a theater performance that's currently in the Black Box Theater. And your last chance to see that play is this weekend. On Friday, it's going on in the morning at 9 a.m. or 7 p.m. Saturday at 7 p.m. or Sunday at 2 p.m. in the Black Box Theater, which is also in Reno. And Piazza's work is in the permanent collections of the Leslie Lohman Museum of Gay and Lesbian Art in New York City, the Museum of Wisconsin Art, the St. Kate's Art Hotel, the Warehouse Museum, and the Racine Art Museum in Wisconsin. She is shown at the International Center of Photography in New York City, the National Portrait Gallery in Washington, D.C., the de Young Museum in San Francisco, the Museum of Contemporary Photography in Chicago, and Dom Wien in Vienna. Lois is also represented by Portrait Society Gallery in Milwaukee. So please welcome Lois Biefeld. Hello, everyone. Thanks so much for coming out. Um, it's really good to be back at uh, Parkside. I exhibited here in 2015 and had such an incredible time while I was here. So thank you for having me again and Colin for thinking of my work. Um, so I titled this talk, I'm always kind of interested in titles, uh, Looking Outward, Looking Inward. And I kind of want to thread that through. So first I'm gonna kind of dig into my trajectory. Uh, I've lived a variety of places and how I kind of have gotten to this place. And then um, I'm gonna dig into how I make a living as a commercial photographer and then I'll talk about the work in the gallery. So I, my trajectory is I was born and raised in Wisconsin and I left when I was 20 to move to Rochester, New York to study at RIT. I studied photography, um, more of a commercial photography basis as I was interested in learning how to light and do all the technical things. And I thought that I could just, I was already creative, but I, I, so I didn't need that um, much to my, yeah. Um, but, and then I moved uh, to Brooklyn, uh, New York City, and I lived there from 20, 2003 to 2010. And then I um, got a job in Milwaukee, so, so working for Kohl's, uh, shooting in-house for them as a fashion photographer. So they brought me back to Milwaukee. And then in, in 2018, my wife got a job in San Francisco. And so we move, moved to the East Bay of, uh, in the San, Fr San Francisco Bay Area to Alameda, which is this little island off, the, off of the coast of Oakland. And we were there just for a couple of years. Um, this was over the pandemic, so it was a curious couple of years. And then I, in that same time period, I decided to go back to graduate school at California Institute of the Arts. And from there, I um, was commuting back and forth between the Bay Area and Los Angeles. And then my wife got transferred in 2020, um, right kind of as the pandemic was pretty, yeah, well in swing, and we moved to Chicago. So we came back to the Midwest, much to, I think, her happiness and somewhat mine. I, I liked California. Um, and then we were trying to figure out, okay, we wanna buy a house. And Milwaukee gives that kind of a much larger uh, opportunity for that. So that's kind of my long trajectory of all over. Um, but I wanna talk about how, how do I make a living? Because I think as students, it's really, this is something that you are actively working towards is to move into the world of the workplace. And it's, it's hard to think about that as an artist, like where can you fit in? So um, I, I work as a commercial photographer. I didn't start out that way. I started out assisting photographers. And so this is me back in like, hmm, maybe 20, 2009 or something, where, or maybe 2008, I'm assisting a photographer on an HGTV shoot in Times Square. That was a big moment. Um, and then these are just some other, I was a digital technician and a photo assistant. So I would 
carry the equipment, I would lug it around, I would set up lights, and then I would uh, basically do whatever the photographer needed to get the shot and make it happen, including hold a giant fake piece of pizza. Um, and it, I did that, I graduated school in 2002, and I did that for about eight years. Um, assisting photographers and I learned so much in that capacity of being able to be a part of the team but not have all the pressure on me and just be able to watch and do whatever it took to get the shot but you know it wasn't I, I it, the, it wasn't my shot so I, I kind of the stress wasn't as heavily there but then at, during that time period I was doing small jobs so I started working for Time Out New York um, they did guidebooks, so they would put out periodic guidebooks, and um, I would go around and photograph all these different restaurants and shopkeepers. This is the Strand Bookstore, um, I think. <laughs> and, um, and then I would shoot for um, organizations like Transportation Alternatives, a bicycling and pedestrian friendly um, organization. And that's kind of a thing I would say as a recommendation is like, Go out and volunteer in things that really matter to you, that I, I felt really strongly about, by, about cycling and about cycling safety. It was something that I was doing a lot when I lived in New York, and I became a part of this organization that was something I believed in. And then I was like, hey, who does your photography? And they were like, we would love to have some you know, pro bono photography. So it was something that I could get familiar in, in you know, how to shoot for a client without having necessarily all of the pressures. And that's also my daughter when she was um, younger as well. So I was also really interested in fashion photography and I was doing a lot of uh, testing and editorial gigs at this time period. So um, this is for Prestige Hong Kong. And it actually originally was just a, a test where, and it, what that means is basically everyone comes together. So, you know, when you're working in commercial photography, there's an entire team of experts that are working together to create one image or a sequence of images. So basically, it's not just me. It's me, a model, a hair and makeup artist, a wardrobe stylist, often a photo assistant, you know, a stylist assistant, and we're all working together in our various er, points of expertise to make a really incredible image. And so this was a test and the, the, I think the stylist, he knew, had a contact at Prestige Hong Kong and they, and they picked up the work and published it in, in their magazine, which was pretty exciting. So as I'm learning and like um, assisting and doing all these things, I'm also, you know, laying the grounds for creating a network of people. And, and that's slowly trickling into small jobs. So I started shooting for Wisconsin Bride Magazine and they became a regular client. And do I, was I excited about wedding dresses and whatever? Not necessarily, but it was a really fun way to be creative with a group of people in an area that wasn't necessarily my, my interest. And I would say that's something that I find that commercial work gives me. It, 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 so thinking about how it runs, you know, um, parallel with my practice, my art practice, the thing that I feel really passionate about and is, you know, what, um, what, why I'm doing this is that with commercial photography, it, it causes me to get out of my comfort zone. I, I don't, probably wouldn't necessarily have ever thought about photographing um, bridal or athletic or even photographing kids, but through my commercial job, it very much so takes me in these routes that I wouldn't have anticipated. And what that does is it makes me work in different ways, and that directly feeds back into my art, art practice. And then I also, again, work with um, you know, organizations that I believe in, and this is for Our Lives magazine, and I used to shoot a lot of uh, editorial for them. So in 2010, I took a in-house job with Kohl's, and basically, um, I moved to Milwaukee. They relocated me from New York, and I was a on-figure fig, on fashion shooter for them. And it was this 
uh, it, working full time was kind of this new thing um, it, that I found to be a really huge benefit because previously um, I was freelance and I was juggling a lot of things and you know getting clients was the main goal but when you're in house you have just the, the the regular going to a uh, just going to the same space you build these relationships you have a sense of like what you, what you're going to do and you're able to really then just focus on the work and then when you leave you're done and you don't have to keep thinking about okay I need to go network I need to go you know meet so and so and and try to get this new new client so for me this was a very a, a very specifically a levelizer in that then my time away from work became a space for just to be able to think about my art practice. So, I, you know, also previous to Cole's, I uh, had never photographed kids other than my daughter. And I think for me, thinking about um, how important kids, bringing kids into my series now, it, it, it's, it's, it's actually pretty integral to think about and make sure that I represent um, children within my series. So, and I don't know that I would have ever really thought about how important that was until I started photographing kids for my job, for my jobby job. Um, so, every day is different when you're shooting commercial work. It's, I mean, today, so I'm now currently working for Quad, but it's, it's, every day is different. And I, today, tomorrow I'm photographing a dog um, for a dog bowl. Today I, I was photographing a, um, like a coin purse and some nuts you know, in a tin. So it's just, it's like kind of all over the place. But I, I love that because I, you don't get bored. You're constantly problem solving and I'm constantly really thinking about lighting and staying atop of like my skill set on lighting. Um, in 2018, when I moved to the Bay Area, I went freelance and I started working with Von Maurer and some other clients, JC Penney's. So the, the last thing that I, I really don't like, oh, let me see if I can make this little GIF go. Okay. Um, the other aspect is you're working with professional models and people that can do amazing things like flips in the air, and that, that just blows my mind. So uh, the commercial work, it, it brings a lot to me. It, uh, even though it, it fundamentally, I think, brings uh, my livelihood and it brings the financial, just being able to financially do my art practice and have you know a house and all of the things, it, it brings a lot more than just that. So uh, I guess my key takeaways about being able to work in the field that I so very much like is that obviously the financial benefit, but also working with a team is a huge aspect. And um, just working in ways that I wouldn't have necessarily worked on in my own you know, capacity, being pushed to work in new ways is a huge boon to that the, the financial, or that the um, commercial uh, work gives me. So I wanna kind of, step now into my art practice. And I want to go back in time. So to kind of share the evolution of me as an artist. So in 2008, I started a, my very first body of work called The Bedroom. And it's, I was living in New York City. Um, at this time, I was sharing a bedroom with my daughter. And we had a curtain that like, divided, I will show you that curtain. Um, and oh, here, we'll go, just go to that. So I had a curtain that divided the space. And you can see, like, my side has kind of my things. And then on her side, she has sort of her things. And we, we, there's just this curious, um, you know, aspect of where my side is reflecting who I am as a person and, and vice versa on hers. And so I, I was really interested in this space and I always have been. As a kid, I would be like, oh, you know, you meet a new friend and be like, show me your room. I, I wanna see your room. And not just to see their toys, but like, I was just curious how, how what was their space like? And so I, um, 
I started to be kind of curious about this space, this, you know, this intimate space where we sleep, where we are at our most vulnerable. Um, we have, we we're, we're, you know, have passion, we have sex, we have um, quiet time, we, all of this, this, you know, the space that's so private, that encompasses so much to us. And I was really curious if it was uh, indeed a reflection of who we are. And so I decided I was gonna make a series about people's bedrooms. And um, I worked on this project for four years. It was my first project. I was, at the time, working on my work as, you know, more so trying to get myself shooting full time and, you know, f for, figure that piece out. So it was, it was a, but I, I was really hungry for something that would, I could work on over time, that I could develop and sort of unravel over time and think about. And so this kind of working in series has done that for me. It's to like really think about a topic and dig deep into it. So um, through, through this, I relocated back to Milwaukee, Wisconsin. I got the job at Kohl's and things kind of really settled for me. And I was at that point able to very much so sit down and like focus on this work and make it, 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 my art practice started to be sort of gel and have a much stronger presence other than just this being this sort of side project that I was doing. So I think it was in 2011, I was, so initially people were like, how do you find your participants? How do you find people to photograph? And I very much so um, started out by photographing friends. And then that felt, you know, very limited. And it, from there, it moved into, okay, I'll photograph friends of friends, or my mom's friends, or you know, relatives' friends. And and that that got more interesting. And then it, it became um, recommendations. People kind of saying, hey, you should photograph my uncle, or so you know, they have an interesting um, story, or you know, I even had a a friend recommend that I photograph his uncle because he had kind of a dungeony sort of set up bedroom. Um, and I was like, wow, okay, yes. And so it, it, it just sort of became word of mouth. But in 2011, I decided I wanted some more geographical range. And so I decided to take my first photography road trip. And so I went from, let's see, Missouri, Arkansas, Mississippi, Louisiana, Texas. And I went for two weeks and I just emailed galleries and community centers, and I was like, hey, I'm looking for people to photograph. Can you connect me? And this, I might have, this is like before I was using Facebook in that way. So now I think it would be much easier. But at that time, I sent out probably hundreds of emails and heard back from a couple. And then the, I, those people referred me to more people on the way. And I think I ended up photographing about 30 people in that two weeks and mainly people I didn't know, which was pretty exciting. So um, that really kind of opened up a different aspect of going into people's homes that I don't know and establishing trust in very quickly in an immediate way of, of, of making a photograph. And so I've since done that same road trip for four total times for different four different bodies of work over the past 10 years. Um, other themes that have became really important to me was to photograph my queer community. Um, and very much so, I would say, um, photographing a lot of, uh, thinking about the population demographically. I really wanted to, with the bedroom, um, I got very fixated on what would, could I make my project, which was going to be 100 photographs of people in their bedrooms, could I make it like demographically representative of the US? And so I got really obsessed with like the breakdown of, of you know, location if people lived in a rural area, a sub suburban area, or in the city. Um, if they, their, their gender, their race, um, and their age. And so I tried because I really wanted it to be much more re representative and I wanted it to get me out of my comfort zone. So did I succeed? Probably not, <laughs> even though I have this really cool spreadsheet. Um, but really what it did is it, it made me think critically about who I was photographing um, and do, you know, is it my right to tell their story? And also um, just making sure that I did get a larger variety of, of, of people. So I 
wanted to say from there to the current work, there's a lot of work. So there are all these series. And that's going to bring us to um, new domesticity, the work that's on view in the gallery. And so I started this work in 2018. Um, I was a part of this art book club with Kate E. Schaefer, Peter Beck, Melissa Dorn, J Jamie Harvey Wilms, and Jamie Harvey Wilms. And they're all artists in Milwaukee area. They are all still in the Milwaukee area. And um, and we were just meeting and reading art texts together and discussing them and basically mainly trying to understand them more than anything else. And it's really helpful to do that within a group setting. And somehow we got landed on this book by Lynn Tillman called What Would Lynn Tillman Do? And we got kind of fixated on it. So um, basically the book is sort of strangely organized. There's a lot of different methods of, of the way that it, the essays are. And we decided we were going to create new work, each of us, in response to a, um, to a specific essay or, sec or, or another essay. And we were going to curate, kind of co-curate this work together into a group show. So, um, I'm just going to read a small section of this as um, an excerpt from the uh, essay Decad Decadism that I really enjoyed. Let's see. I regularly question my preferences, why I like or dislike writing a photograph. I don't trust experience, even if it has shaped me. I don't fervently trust what I think or believe while I believe it still. A pox on absolutes. I could trace a genealogy of what I think and like, which is to some extent, what I was exposed to taught, what I was exposed to, taught, made conscious of, and decided not to be or accept. Tendrils of difference and objections, spouting rebellions and self-discoveries. I could list them, but I, I couldn't create an order for my character and hold it, me, to a neat line. When I learned to write, I wrote fast, not on the lines, only below or above. My preferences change and change again. And I thought there was something so interesting to me about this space of like, how do we know what we know? How do we, you know, like what we, what we think, what we, um, what we attach meaning to? And so I somehow got deep into this essay, which I should probably read again, because I haven't read it for many years, and um, other than small excerpts. But, and we decided to take portraits of each of the artists within their home space. And we had been meeting in each other's homes and there was, you know, there were pets, there were children, there were just different dynamics that come with the home that are really exciting to me. And I thought, okay, there's something about what, like, what is it about, domesticity, what is it about how do we na negotiate and navigate our roles and our, our um, the, just the space of the home and how do we think about it that kind of creates the system that we have chosen to live in. And so I thought, all right, I'm going to photograph each of the artists in the group and we'll see what happens. So this is um, Jamie and Kurt. And I wanted to... I don't know at what point, because my essay didn't really overtly talk about domesticity, but at some point we just started talking as a group about domesticity a lot. And there is a essay in the Lynn Tillman book about, the, uh, about Edith Wharton, but I, 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 I feel like it just sort of naturally evolved. And so um, I, love, I love looking at uh, roots of words and how words are defined and I really liked devoted to home duties and pleasures not just duty but pleasure um, and then of course domesticity means of or relating to the household but I think there's something inherently about the word domesticity that has just a connotation of maybe another era um, if you think about it what do you think about when you think of the word domesticity? In my mind, I think of kind of this like 1960s um, housewife that you know is making you know the dinner, and then the, the the father comes home and the kids are all like, 
yay, daddy's home, let's have dinner. And, and so I have this like weird connotation that's outdated, <laughs> not my life, and, and yet I still have that, that sort of overture or overarching arching sort of um, connotation to that word. And so, um, and, and I, so I, I was really interested in like how, where do these roles come from? Or, you know, obviously we are raised and we have we, we, the impact of how we are raised and the way that, that that is our family structure, the way we think about family and the dynamic of the space of the home. Um, this is Peter Beck the, I, and his family and then Melissa Dorn. And so, but I was really fixated initially at the duties and the tasks of the home and thinking about domesticity as labor. And it wasn't until like a, a ways in, and this is again, very early on, this is me just deciding to make some work because we're, I'm doing a response with another group of artists. I, this is not a series yet, this is just me kind of doing this thing. And I, um, basically just, you know, we start having these conversations. So I decided to do these audio interviews where I asked them, well, okay, what were your parents like when you grew up? Did, and did they, how did, you know, did they model a traditional sort of um, gendered roles or did, was it some other thing? What, you know, what did, um, what did you have to do chores? Um, so uh, it became this conversation that sort of rooted the photographs. So this is Kate Schaefer and this is a curious image because for whatever reason she didn't feel comfortable being photographed in her home and so she asked, wanted to still be a part of it since we're all, I was photographing all the artists. And she was like, well, I do a lot of the grilling. That's kind of my role with her and her partner. And I was like, okay, well, can we just, you could be grilling at my house. So this is a total fiction. Um, I mean, this is not even near her house. And yet she brought over her grill. She brought all of the things, except for that's my plate and probably my cinder block. Um, and <laughs> Uh, that was the house next door to me, and we, we made this image. So again, there's, I'm very interested in the delicate lines of, of fiction and, of, and where fiction meets real life. And so again, this is very early on. This is not really a series yet, but this image is quite an outsider within the larger series as it stands now. But what it also brought up for me, thinking about Kate you know, wanting to perform her domesticity for me, not necessarily within her home space, made me think about how, it, how we were performing our domesticity or in these photographs. And that, to me, I very much so see in these photographs a performance. So this is um, my family, my wife on the left, my daughter vacuuming in the back, and me scooping out the butternut squash. <laughs> so um, there's also that, this curious mashup of trying to cram everything into the frame that I was finding really interesting. That no, not necessarily, could this happen? Yes, but would it, you know, not necessarily on a regular basis. So I'm really interested in like sort of scripting, uh, creating a script together with my participants and figuring out what each person is going to be doing in that space and um, why, like what's the root out of it? I mean, I did a lot of cooking, so it made sense for me to cook. My wife's like, I always do the laundry. You know, and again, I was very focused on uh, chores and the labor part at this point. So we just, we had our show, it was at the Frank Juarez Gallery in um, the, the Marshall Building in Milwaukee. And I normally print, the like you'll see in the gallery, the photographs just standard. Um, for this, I was like, what about all those like trinkety, you know, like just objects that you can put photographs on, like a blanket or like a mug or the, the plate. So I, for this, again, it was more thinking, responding with other artists as opposed to just thinking about my practice. So I, I, I made this, um, blanket 
and this is an exterior shot of the gallery. It was this teeny little gallery space that Frank was running for a couple of years um, that was really fun to fill up. So basically, you can see we, all our work is kind of layered and on top of each other. Um, Jamie Harvey Wilms made basically this wallpaper that extends into, onto the chair. Um, that's a auto woman by Melissa Dorn Richards that's, uh, instead of auto man. And um, then on the, on the TV tray is a puzzle of one of the photographs you saw earlier. We also had a refrigerator that we had beverages for people to take and be able to use, but, uh, or drink and refreshment, but also it was covered with rejection letters. Um, thinking about as an artist, you're going to have to apply to stuff. If you want, I mean, you can make work just for yourself and that is absolutely 100% like do that if that's all you need. And then that should be the core in my mind. But some people do want to exhibit. And in order to do that, you gotta apply to stuff. And a lot of stuff. And I get a lot of rejections every day. So we thought it would be fun to celebrate instead of like, you know, you put on your report card up on the refrigerator when you get, a, you know, good grades. We're like, let's celebrate those rejections. Because in my mind, it's like when you've put yourself out there. Also on there, you can see, let's see, oh, you can see my cursor. You can see the um, beautifully gold-rimmed mug that I had printed with Melissa's picture on it. And these are Kate E. Schaefer's, um, she did portraits of our pillows, each artist's pillow, in, as a, um, in a soap sculpture or a soap carving. Um, and then this is a, a reticulated broom sculpture that Peter um, did. And these are draw mop study drawings that Melissa Dorn did. So basically there's this really entangled sort of community that we started and this entangled sort of exhibition that um, digs in deep into, yes, this text that we were reading, but also just into each other's practices and us as artists. And we also celebrated with a cake, of course. So, from there, it was like, okay, I'm hooked. I'm so interested now in this, like, uh, in this idea of is there a new domesticity? Is there, is there, you know, from my weird, you know, 1960s definition? And I was really interested in basically, I want to go out and photograph a bunch of people. And that, that, that's kind of how I work this accumulative sort of nature. So, um, I want to read a quote by um, Gaston Bachelard uh, from The Poetics of Space. The successive houses in which we have lived have no doubt made our gestures commonplace, but we are very surprised when we return to the old house after an odyssey of many years to find that the most delicate gestures, the earliest gestures suddenly come alive, are still fault faultless. In short, the house we were born in has engraved within us the hierarchy of, our, of the various functions of inhabiting. We are the diagram of the functions of inhabiting that particular house, and all the other houses are but variations on a fundamental theme. The house we were born in is more than an embodiment of home. It is, an all, it is also an embodiment of dreams. And I think that sort of just encapsulates my interest of like thinking about that imprint of our childhood home and, uh, and our childhood family and how that sculpts us and then how we, you know, rethink, sometimes subvert and push and create, decide on our own spaces and how we all choose to end up living. So I started photographing, um, uh, you know, families, individuals, and uh, roommates, anyone who um, was within this space, including Colin's family, <laughs> and um, who I've had the really wonderful pleasure of getting to photograph um, for many, for several of my series. And I, the formula kind of, to some degree, stuck from that initial um, photographing the, my, my artist friends. So I, 
had these questions that I formulated, and that, so the, the format was this. I'd schedule it, I'd tell somebody about this project, and then I would say, all right, we're gonna start with an informal audio interview. I'm gonna ask you a lot of questions, and that will lead us to the photograph. So basically, I would ask, how do you make house or play house? Um, what is your role? And th th these actually evolved from here. I think I had like a printout of like my finalized questions, but this is my very first list of questions. Um, and so I wanna play a bit of that, that audio for you all. Um, this should be playing by now. So I have to it's not up right now, but. Um, put on my clothes and eat breakfast and watch TV. And um, I what else is on the to, list? Um, put on my shoes, get my lunches in my bag, pack, brush teeth, put on my coat and snow gear and shoes if I need the snow gears. And um, then I have to go to the bathroom, and then we leave. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So she has a visual schedule. And then sometimes follow. I get to bring toys to in my backpack to school. I think the word domesticity has like a very straight feel to it. You know, like it has kind of a, a connotation. Um, uh, you know, this idea of like domestic life, I guess I had to go straight to like how it's marketed in that like very Donna Reed kind of keeping up with the Joneses, like kind of a feel. Um, how about you? Yeah, I don't know. Just the this sort of stereotypical image of America from the 1950s, white and heterosexual and suburban. Um, I feel like that dates you know, us, you know, about, yeah. cause like I have that, I have that connotation from what I absorbed as a kid. Mm -hmm. So yeah, I guess I think of like marriage, heterosexuality, like living in a very particular way, um, and middle class, which is also kind of screwed up now that I think about it, right? That like this idea of like healthy living and like wholesomeness is associated with material possessions, with like the nuclear family, with like the single family home. Well, my parents, um, my mom was American citizen. My dad was from Mexico, but they bought him when he was seven months. He crossed the river. He was a mojadito. My grandma was coming from uh, Spain our last name is Espericueta mm -hmm. and Uribe. And, and um, so we live in Texas most of the time and, and, uh, until I got married. When I got married, they all moved here to California. Yeah, but we, 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 my dad, we used to work in, in the fields with my dad. Yeah. My mom would stay home and make tortillas and wash the clothes and all that. Mm -hmm. Uh, and my mom was very clean too. Oh my God, my mom was clean. You know, if you iron something, she wouldn't like it the way it was ironed. She would go like that, iron it again. You know, or the dishes, the pan. This is this pan is not clean right. You know, you didn't wash it right. Wash it again. So I. So that, the audio then, we have these conversations and then we start talking about, well, what do you see yourself doing in the photograph? What, what do you, would you, how would you like to represent yourself in, in the photograph? And everyone kind of creates this dial, this story about, okay, I, I you know, I regularly do this. I, I, um, Eli here is like weighing the kitchen, the kittens, because they um, foster kittens and they have to keep daily weights, and that was his 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 job. And again, this is early into the series, so I was still very fixated on chores, not just um, you know living in the home or pleasures, and. 
so that slowly the photograph comes together and then I would ask people to bring out like objects of meaning that they would like to have represent to help represent themselves within it. This is a little behind the scenes photograph of me. Um, sometimes I'm photographing in really tight spaces and so I, it, to get that shot I had to be in their kitchen sink sitting in it. Um, and so for example with the objects of meaning they, they have, are, you know, this is Susie and Luke, and they have two young babies, and they wanted to make sure their cat was in the image. They really, they already had this beautiful um, domestic wall art that said domestic, and they, they really wanted to have that in, um, within the context of the, the piece. And having this sort of uh, toy, you know, the loose toy that's always, there's always a loose toy on the ground. And, and Luke regularly um, makes, fires in their fireplace and that's something that where they find rel relaxation so that's how the story kind of comes together so I was really uh, interested in or I've always been sort of interested in the Dutch genre painting from the 17th century century and thinking about like the way that you know painters were um, not only lighting and this very or you know making this incredibly beautiful light um, and it was something that I'm really interested in as well, but also thinking about the, this interest in the, the everyday and this really um, exciting point of time where we went from religious art being um, the center or historical paintings as center, you know, and, and landscapes as being the focus to actually you know, the middle class and upper middle class being the focus. This is an exciting point and shift in art. Um, and yes, it happened because of, you know, Dutch colonialism and the, the fact of trade and wealth flooding a country. Um, but, and it also happened because of a rejection of Calvinism or of Catholicism for Calvinism. So there was less of an art focus. Um, so this, this Dutch golden age I find really interesting in seeing these, these very curated um, photographs that are about, um, you know, about every day. And so for me, I, I think a lot about those works in relationship to the way I'm sort of approaching my lighting. Um, I, I see very much so the, the photograph as a stage and um, so I'm, I'm very much so interested in lighting each subject and creating this very um, lit uh, portrait so that you know this isn't this documentary image. Also it's interesting within the paintings, um, pets also were featured. So in, within the family structure, pets are really, I mean, they're, they're so important as well. So we were always trying to cajole um, and give all the pets as many treats as possible to keep them in the frame. Um, I would say, you know, photographing the children were sometimes difficult, but the pets were really difficult. And even thinking about gesture. Um, now this just happened naturally with her leaning on her hand. Um, but if you'll notice, she, this woman also has her hand up. So I'm really interested in that as well. So the work, I was kind of close to finishing it in um, 2020. I was like, all right, I'm going to do that road trip um, in summer of 2020, and I'm going to take that road trip down and that, you know, photograph all the people that I've been photographing, and then I'm going to be done with this body of work. And of course, that didn't happen. Pandemic shut it all down. Um, oh, I have a quote in here. That's just random. So, well, <laughs> but it's not. I just didn't. Yeah, I didn't lead up to it well. Anyways, I'm going to interrupt myself. We could say that history happens in the very repetitions of gestures, which is what gives bodies their tendencies. We might note here that the labor of such repetitions disappears through labor if we work hard at if we work hard at something when it seems effortless. Our body takes a shape of this repetition. We get stuck in certain alignments as an eff effect of this work. The work of repetition is not neutral work. It orients the body in some ways rather than others. This is Sarah Ahmed's from Queer Phenomenology. And I'm really, again, think, I think so much about our, our rituals, our habits, um, and, and that very much so plays out within the space of the home. And so, it's interesting because yes, people are performing their domesticity for the camera, 
but it's really natural because they already know these movements. It's like doing your homework, reading a book, writing a grocery list, or baking. All of that is, is such a commonplace everyday thing. And so people very naturally go into these, into these poses. So lastly, I kind of want to hit on the fact that I'm very much a, um, am interested in my queer community and ensuring representation within that. Um, I really love this book, Cruising Utopia, by Jose um, Esteban Munez. Uh, Often we can glimpse the worlds proposed and promised by queerness in the realm of the aesthetic. The aesthetic, especially the queer aesthetic, frequently contains blueprints and schemata of a forward-dawning futurity. Both the ornamental and the quotidian can contain a map of the utopia that is queerness. Turning to the aesthetic in the case of queerness is nothing like, in its, nothing like and escape from the social realm insofar as, as queer aesthetics map future social relations. Queerness is also, a performative, um, is also performative because it is not simply a being but a doing for and toward the future. Queerness is essentially about the rejection of the here and now in an instance on potentiality or a concrete possibility for another world. And so, when thinking about my own um, family dynamic with my wife and daughter, our roles aren't just automatic. There's not this automatic assumption that, well, I'm the lady, so I'm going to cook, and yada yada, right? And it, it, very much so, we determine our roles that we want. And I think that that there's something um, the home space for queer families have. Has, that space has been a sacred space because it's where we can feel safest and um, really let be ourselves. And so for me, um, it's really important to photograph uh, all these queer, just to see the, the, the variety of like different ways that people, you know, th- how they approach their home. And I, um, was fortunate to photograph dear friends of mine, um, Shannon and Kat, in multiple iterations. And this is kind of a, a, a strange right turn in that I photographed them three times over the period of time. This is in 2018, very early into the series. Um, and so, you know, notice it's task related, although Shannon is um, organizing books and uh, She's in the audience tonight. So, and anyways, uh, and then I, I wanted to photograph again because in 2021 their family really changed. And um, they not only have a roommate, um, Alex, or at that time did, but they were fostering um, babies at that, at that time and looking to f- do foster to adoption. So there was this really, you know, thinking about family making and, um, and what it means to make a family as, as you know, a queer family, it, it, there's, it take, it's a different um, route it, it, than the just nor- prescribed channels. And so eventually um, we made this final image in 2022 um, with their daughter, um, Juna. And it r- made me think of this constant shifting and evolution space that is the home. It's not a fixed permanent thing. And notice how also, speaking of not fixed or permanent, the room we photographed in the exact same space and look at how much, you know, some paint and, and rearrangement and how much the space also shifted. So I'm really interested in re-photographing people over space and time. Um, the same with uh, Willie May, speaking on that terms. I've been photographing Willie May since 2011, maybe 2012, and uh, for, almost all my series. And she's my um, coworker, my friend and coworker, um, her, her, his mom. So this is in 2011. This is me photographing for the bedroom series. 2013 for weeknight dinners. 2016 um, for the neighborhood. 2018 for a body of work called Celebration. And then that final, or the very first shot, it, this is her new domesticity image. Okay. Um, so I want to, I know we're getting close on time, so I wanted to just 
think about looking outward. To me, a lot of that was looking outward, correct? And I wanted to move to looking inward because when the pandemic happened, and I'll move through this fast, um, I couldn't make work in other people's homes. So instead, I um, worked on this body of work called Household, where I turned the camera around and really um, dug into my own, my own home space with my wife. We were living in California at the time, and uh, this was May of 2020, so you know where we were at in the world at that time. And um, I was interested in both our routines and rituals, but also this kind of created a new space of collaboration because my wife very much so and I 100% collaborated on this, and I see her just as much of the artist as, as, as myself. Um, we both you know, brainstormed the, the ideas, we, um, we, I changed my titling. Most of my titles in the past were just name, maybe name and place. Um, now the, these titles, uh, May 6th, Jackie gets ready to work, to work from home. Lois gets ready to cop a feel. Or May 18th, Jackie was 27 years old when she could first, when she first could hear the sounds of other people chewing food, urine ricocheting off porcelain, and turn signals in the car. Um, so the, the captions became this new space for me to like basically extend ideas outwards from the photograph. And May 20th, Lois waits until after Jackie turns off the light to put in her mouth guard. So there's also a lot of humor and being able to I don't know, be really vulnerable and raw for the camera, but in a kind of lovable way. And we made a photograph every day for the month of May, and that's what is encompassed in this work. So what now? I don't know, somehow I got into a lot of projects, and I have like eight projects I'm in the middle of right now, and I don't know how to resolve any of them. And I always tell people, recommend, have like two things going. That way when you end one, you're still, you have something else to kind of keep you, you know, keep you moving forward. Don't have eight. Okay, so thank you everyone. Um, I'd love to open it up for questions. So why, why did I choose living in New York? Um, I visited when I was at Rochester Institute of Technology for a, a class. We went down for a New York trip and I just fell in love. I love a big city and I did, there's just so much to do. I like, it just really resonated with me as far as the way of living, I, I felt like there's just constantly things to do. There's constantly, there's so many different, you know, people, uh, so many different languages, so many different religions. It just it's so just so much to just be a part of. So. Wait, say that again. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, to study is hard because, I mean, I would say. So, because I studied in upstate New York, but to study is hard just because New York's expensive. Um, and when you're a student, you don't often have re like that much income, as you all probably know. Um, and so, uh, I, when I was looking at graduate schools, I very seriously considered going to SVA, and they gave me a decent package, including a really good work stipend, but I was just like, no, I still don't know how I'm gonna afford to live here. So to live when I would say to have, I had a, you know, I was assisting and then shooting small jobs and things, that was fine. But if you can do, swing it to study and get a stipend and a full ride, yes, do it. <laughs>
That's an interesting observation. I think, I don't know. I've not, I haven't really thought about it, because I think with the space of the commercial work, it's usually working with models, and they're getting paid, and they're, they're professionals, and they're, yes, they, they do this, and they like do their li like little, they do that, this dance, where then I shoot through them doing the, their you know, professional moves. And so, um, but they, it's supposed to look authentic, right? Because we're selling joy, we're selling all of these things. So, um, whereas my work work is all real people, and yes, but they're performing for the camera too. So there, there is some interesting overlap, and I, I absolutely see them like running side by side in a capacity. But yeah, what? Yeah. Right. Right. Yeah, definitely. Because this is this like we're you know selling this idea of the holidays, right, and this lifestyle. So there is something very interesting. Yeah, because it's trying to mirror, mirror something real, right? Okay. Yeah. Yeah, so for the objects, I went to like Walmart and literally just ordered their tapestry and their photo tapestry and their, their photo mug. I'm trying to remember, I might have done like Cafe Press for something. I really liked like the gold rim around things. So I, I wanted to like lean into these like specialty commemorative like objects that are keepsakes. Um, so, but that was just online, me uploading images to and ordering from a yeah, big Walmart or whatever. And then for my, um, my work work, I do all my own printing. I have a large 44 inch wide Epson printer and I, yes, hunker down and <laughs> then there's prints all drying all over on my bed, you know, on my office space floor and then I, it, it always goes out into my wife's office and <laughs> uh, so for me it was between Epson and Canon and I just had what's more familiar with Epson and then it was just I did the research. There's not that many options for that l size. When the, you get smaller consumer, there's a million options. But um, th really, there was it was a price. It was price point and um, the the most expensive one I could afford. But research is king. Yeah, so I mean, I had, you know, as you saw the image of, I, I regularly would photograph my wife and me for, and my daughter for other series, but it's, it's a different thing doing it on like a consistent daily basis. I will say conflict did arise. There, there, it was not always easy to make images together. Um, you know, the, Jackie didn't always feel like doing it. <laughs> and, and sometimes, as frankly, I didn't feel like it, even though it really gave me something to do during the pandemic um, because I, I was, you know, a student at the time and it, I couldn't go and make my work in other people's homes. So there was a way for me to be able to continue to make. Um, with and, and you know we really couldn't go out much either, so um, it was it was kind of great. Yeah. Yes. Right. Um, so I just wondering how much that yeah. Your, your yeah. 
Yeah, and I should have acknowledged that like the home space is not always a safe space, and it is not always a, a, a space that is you know okay for everyone, um, and it is a privileged space or can be. So, um, but yeah, I would say like with the household series, I, it came out in some of the photographs. We we have, we talk head on about conflict. Um, there there's an image specifically about that. Um, there's us it, like I didn't read that one, but we're like basically reading um, chapter five, Anger is a Stop Sign. We're both reading the same book about, you know, basically the power of two. <laughs> so um, sort of nods to that. I would say in the audio, uh, so the audio lays in a four hour audio, it's a two channel audio piece. And it it's, just a huge mashup of all of the different audio um, bits and fragments around all the questions. And that, I would say that's where we, there's probably a lot more depth. And then I, I, I did have moments where I photographed families where there was a lot of tension and that was very interesting. Did it come through in the photograph? Maybe a little, but I also, um, you know, if, if they were like, we want this to be a part of the photograph, that would be one thing. But I want to be respectful because it is a collaboration. Yeah. Yeah, so for me, most of the time, I am less hands-on with designers just because I, I shoot, and then the art director takes over from there. They do the editing, they do, um, you know, all of, they drop it into the layout, and they work with the image and make the layout with that, and they'll work often with the designer. So, but it is a team dynamic. Like, it's like, I do my part, with a whole group of people, and then they hand it off to another team who do their part before it ever goes even to press or online. And so it, it, it is very much so in, uh, this, in this web or a network that, in, I mean, just for like one image, it's kind of ridiculous, um, just to sell something. But yeah, I, I would say um, there's a lot of adjacency for to work within that, within the field, which is pretty exciting. Say that again? Yes, yes. Oh yeah, so like, let's just go back to one of these images. Like often, basically, they'll start out with a mood board and they'll, um, whoops, um, and they'll just, like with the cold stuff, they'll start out with a mood board and they'll be like, all right, we want to get this really cute picture of a, like a little kid and a dog and they're in this moment, you know, and, and they, they, may, they may have an image very similar to this. I, I get this all the time where they're like, we want to do this, basically copy this. And I'm like, we can't really copy this. We have to do something else or it's copying and we could get sued. <laughs> um, so then it's like, well, you know, but usually an art director will, you know, be like, the best art directors actually just draw stuff because then it's just a core of an idea. It's a true idea instead of a, we like this. Um, but yeah, basically they, they kind of tell me what type of lighting, what type of um, emotion that they want the, the models to have. And then from there, I, I light, I direct, and then the art director is right there with me being like, oh, can we get a little more of this? Can you make the guy in the back look, I want him to look over his shoulder because I want to see his face better. The muff is like hiding his face. Or can you guys, can we have them skipping? How about, how about if they're skipping? So it's just this back and forth, back and forth kind of conversation while, while I'm shooting. Yeah, so I'm, I, 
I'm really interested in, because I have done some documentary. I photographed my daughter's um, cross-country team for a whole season. And that is, I think, the truest to my documentary photography that I've ever done. And I really did enjoy it. Um, but to me, that's just kind of paying attention and watch things unfold and just cap capturing and um, getting these moments. And whereas I'm more interested in sort of creating something and definitely the lighting is so integral to me. With documentary photography, yes, yeah, sometimes you do a little fill flash or something, but for the most part, you don't interfere at all. You don't impose anything onto the scene that wasn't, other than you're still imposing because you're still choosing the moment and choosing the edit, right? And so there's always, an, there's, photography is never this like true, you know, idea that we may think it is. Um, and so, but for me, like, like imposing the lighting and like very much so concretely, A, I think it's so I can control the lighting and I can control exactly how it looks and how it, it creates a feeling and a mood within, just as the Dutch painters were doing. Um, I, I, so I think there is an element of also creating a mood, but also, um, I, I want it to read very much so as uh, a photograph that is not me just coming in and, you know, a fly on the wall and capturing this mere moment. So it's, it's, I think it's just an important aspect to really make it clear. So that's a great question. Paid versus unpaid, like unpaid internships versus like, it's, when I was assisting, I was paid. It was a day rate at that time. It was this in the, you know, early 2000s, like 200 to 300 dollars a day, which is actually decent. Um, and it, I don't know that it's changed that much since then, but I feel like people get paid a little more than that. Um, but basically, yeah, I think it's really important to get paid. I just do. We're all trying. We live in a consumeristic society. <laughs> like we live in a society that requires us to, you know, pay for our lodging, pay for these different things. And so I, I'm a firm believer in getting paid. I. That being said, I don't know if it's like an incredible opportunity that is short. Maybe if you can swing it, maybe it's worth it. You have to just weigh the benefits. Like, what are the benefits? Because there are larger benefits than financial benefits, right? I mean, experience and is in and it being in proximity, and and the networking that could happen are very important. I still think people should be get paid, though. Okay. That's a great question. So how did I become a photo assistant? Basically, I, I looked up all these photographers. I was graduated college. I um, was still in Rochester, New York for one year. And I was like, all right, I'm going to look up all the photographers. And like, I basically sent them a little mailer, like a resume. And I said, photo assistant on it. And then it had some of my pictures so that they knew I was also an interested, you know, like I was interested in photography. And then I had my resume on there. And then I called them like a week later and I was like, hey, I love your work. I mean, literally phone call. And because um, this is like 2003. And I was like, I love your work. Can I come in and meet you? I'd love to assist for you. And I heard back from some people. I also, you know, follow, I think, Maybe, I feel like it was just starting to email at that point. Uh, and may, that was uh, becoming a little bit norm, more of a norm for communication. But maybe I followed up with an email. And then some people were like, yeah, come on in. I'd love to meet you. And that's kind of how it started. And then the, the key is it's hard at first to get in. But then you, as soon as like you become an asset on set, then it's like they hire you again and again and again. So. And that's, and you meet other people and they recommend you. 
like all the time I'm asking, I'm like, hey, does, do you know any other photo assistants? Because we need somebody on set like next week and we can't find anyone. So, all right, thank you guys.